That's Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 26, on page 1095. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out, and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let, let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in, went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show us Show us what, which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. If you're anything like me, you might have found that reading a little bit odd. I wonder what you were thinking as Josie was reading it to us. Uh, maybe you're not used to church at all, in which case... Everything we've been doing this evening is a bit odd to you. Uh, maybe you're not used to St. Helens, you're visiting, in which case you're really welcome, but perhaps you're trying to get used to the different way that we do things compared to the church that you've been to before. Even if you're a regular here at St. Helens, perhaps you found that reading a little bit strange, a bit of an interruption in the narrative of Acts. Because if you were here last week, you'd have seen as we started this book of Acts, uh, this book, looking at the ongoing work of the Lord Jesus, uh, you'd have seen that one of the overwhelming features of last week was this building sense of tension as we wait for the big events to kick off. Uh, Jesus spent much of last week building to the climax in chapter 1, verse 8, where he said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And now we're waiting for that moment to come, aren't we? And we're waiting for Luke to tell us about when the Holy Spirit came. And we're desperate for that moment to come. But Luke wants us to wait another 15 verses before he gets there. He won't let us hear about that until next week. Because first of all, he's got something very, very important indeed to cover. He needs to tell us about the apostles the apostles, and not just regular followers of the Lord Jesus, the apostles were the original group of Jesus' closest followers, the twelve. The word apostle literally means sent one. And they had been given a core role in Jesus' mission. They were what one scholar has called the authoritative collegium which is a posh term to say they had lots of authority. I like to think of them as the core team the foundation of Jesus' new people. And our whole faith stands or falls on their testimony. They are, in fact, the real witnesses that Jesus was talking about last week. 
I said in last week's sermon that we are witnesses, but we haven't seen Jesus like they had, have we? When we talk about Jesus, we are relying entirely on their witness. In fact, when Luke uses the word witness in his book, most of the time he seems to be using it in a technical way about the apostles. We are second-hand witnesses, really. It is through their apostolic words that Jesus' kingdom is going to advance. It is their apostolic word which formed the New Testament, the second part of that book you're holding in your hands. We are second-hand witnesses who are wholly dependent on the apostles' words. Our whole faith stands or falls on their testimony, which means we need to have rock-solid confidence about what they're saying before we even entertain the idea of taking it out to other people. We need bulletproof conviction about the apostolic word if we're going to be sure that we're not wasting our time. I'm not saying just a sort of inclination to believe what they're saying. We're going to need going to the stake certainty if we're going to stand with the apostles in the face of a world that is increasingly hostile to what they say. That is what Roland Taylor had when he was led to his death in 1555. I don't think he's a relative of our rector. Not sure if he thinks that either. Uh, Roland Taylor was the rector of Hadley in Suffolk at a time when it was a crime to even read the Bible. But he persisted in teaching it, convinced of the authority of the apostolic word. He was tried and then sentenced to death. And as he was led to the stake at which he would be burned to death, he said to the gathered crowd, good people, I have taught you nothing but God's holy word and those lessons I have taken out of God's blessed book, the Holy Bible. And I am come hither this day to seal it with my blood. Roland Taylor had going to the stake certainty in the apostolic word. And in a world that is increasingly hostile to this book, we need it as well, don't we? If you're not a Christian, you need to know that you can back the authors of this book if you're going to take it seriously. And if you are a Christian, well, then you need certainty if you're going to shape your whole life around it. And so it's wonderful for us that certainty is the very reason that Luke got his pen out even 2,000 years ago. Acts is the second of two volumes written by the ancient historian Luke. And at the beginning of his first, he made abundantly clear why he was writing. Luke 1 verse 4, which I've printed a bit of on the handout in your sheets. Uh, He says that he gathered the source material that you may have certainty concerning the things that uh, you've been taught. Uh, Luke wants us to have certainty. And so before he recounts the coming of the Holy Spirit, we will get that Uh, We will get to hear about that next week. He wants to give us certainty about the apostles in particular. And so three reasons. Uh, You can see on your handouts, three reasons to have certainty about them. Firstly, the witnesses are unchanged. The witnesses are unchanged. I think that's what we're supposed to get about that list of names in verse 13. And maybe to many of us, it just seemed like a list of 12 boys' names, which I guess in a sense it is, Uh, but actually it is exactly the same list in basically the same order that we got back in Luke's first volume, chapter 6, which you can check out later. Indeed, we get the same list of men in both Matthew and Mark. Sometimes people claim that they're different lists of different names, and so people say that there was no real established core team. There was just a bunch of people with no consensus about who the authoritative ones were. But actually, the differences are massively overstated. In fact, there's only really one difference at where Luke talks about Judas, son of James. Matthew and Mark put a guy called Thaddeus. But the scholar Richard Balcom has shown how easy to explain that is. Indeed, he's shown that it's most likely that guy is just one guy with two different names, Thaddeus and Judas, son of James. Apart from that, the lists are basically identical, even down to the structure of the list. And I won't go through that now. You can ask me about that later if you're interested in that sort of thing. Uh, But Luke is recording this list of names for us again here to show us at the beginning of his second volume 
that the core team is unchanged from the original. The same people who started the journey are the same people who are continuing it. The witnesses are unchanged. But I can see from some of you that you're sort of silently screaming. And thank you for doing this silently. Quite distracting if you are out loud screaming. Uh, But sort of thinking to yourself, Tim, can you not read? Clearly the list is different. Uh, The first 11 are the same, but there is a name missing. Judas. Uh, Not Judas, son of James, he's there. But the other Judas. Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus. He was there back in Luke 6. And he's there in the list that Matthew and Mark gave us, but he's not here in Acts 1. It means that the number has dropped down from 12 to 11. And you can see why that's important if you want to check out Luke 22 later, but we won't go into that now. But it's more than just a missing name. It's a real dent to our confidence in the apostles. Because if one of them can so spectacularly mess up, Well, it suggests they might all be compromised. And that's why we need Luke's second point. The witnesses are uncompromised. The witnesses are uncompromised. For those who are less familiar with what Judas did, Luke gives us a bit of revision. Uh, Let me pick it up from verse 16. Uh, Peter said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his boughs gushed out and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is field of blood. They're pretty unsavory verses, aren't they? Again, people get in a tizzy about these verses. They suggest they're different from what Matthew has given us. Actually, I think when put together with Matthew, it explains why uh, Judas' body burst open, as verse 18 tells us. Uh, Matthew tells us that Judas hanged himself, and presumably after some time hanging in the Middle Eastern sun, when his body was finally cut down. It fell in this gruesome manner and left his entrails all over the field. It doesn't particularly bear thinking about, does it? Especially those of us who are going to be eating later. But suffice to say, Judas was not in a fit position to carry on as apostle. You might say he didn't have the stomach for it. I I thought that might get a groan, not a boo, but never mind. But here's the question... What do we do with the fact that this authoritative group of 12, the core team, the foundation of Jesus' new people, what do we do with the fact that they've been, apparently, compromised? One of the 12 guided those who came to arrest Jesus. It's possible to see Judas Iscariot as a bit of a Lance Armstrong of the apostles. You know the cyclist who uh, a while back was exposed as a doping cheat and stripped of all of his uh, titles? Uh, He has brought the whole of professional cycling into disrepute. Now everybody is suspicious of really successful cyclists. It's almost assumed that many of them are cheating uh, because somebody has been exposed as a cheat. It's possible to see Judas a little bit like that, a bad apple who casts a sinister light on the rest of them. Well, Peter has our answer. Verse 16 again. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. And then down in verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. In other words, God promised this. Uh, Look back at the songbook of Israel from hundreds of years before. Uh, Look at the poems of King David, Psalms 69 and 109. God predicted Jesus' sufferings and particularly a betrayer. Judas didn't muck up the plan. He proved it. He didn't compromise the plan. He confirmed it. Even through Judas, 
God was fulfilling his plan. And we don't have time right now to go into the area of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. If you're interested in that, please do download some of the talks you could find on the St. Helens Resource Library on the website. For now, we simply need to see that Judas was not somebody who's, who should make us doubt the rest of them. He's not the tip of the iceberg, the first of many bad apples. He is the long-promised, one-promised betrayer. His betrayal has no bearing on the rest of them. The witnesses are uncompromised. But none of that really tells me why I should have certainty about them, does it? I've simply denied that there's these other problems. Uh, They've not changed except for one, and that one was promised, so it's not really a a reason to be concerned about the rest of the team. Fine, I've denied some problems, but what can we say positively about the apostles, which helps us to trust them? What can we say positively that that gives us the confidence that we need to have in the apostolic words? What can we say positively about them to give us going to the stake certainty? Well, as Judas's replacement is picked, that is exactly what Luke tells us. And it takes us to our third point. The witnesses are qualified. The witnesses are qualified. Let me read again from verse 21. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Of course, this is narrating the identification of Judas's replacement, but in doing so, Luke tells us two criteria needed for an apostle to be qualified to take on the role. And did you spot that first criteria in what I just read? Firstly, they were there. They were there. That's exactly what Peter has just called for. Someone there from the baptism of John up until the day when Jesus was taken up. At the baptism of John, marking the beginning of Jesus' ministry in every single one of the accounts of Jesus' life that we have. Some other things happened before that. You can read about them in Luke 1 and 2. But the baptism of John was where it all kicked off. And of course, the day where Jesus was taken up, that marks the end of his earthly ministry. Presumably, everybody in the room had been around by that point. But the key witnesses, the core team, the authoritative collegium, whatever that means. They had to be those who were there from the start. They weren't happy with someone who just joined the party at the 11th hour. It needed to be somebody who saw the whole thing, who was in a position to share from his own knowledge of Jesus's ministry. Imagine a jury passing judgment on a defendant. They need to be listening throughout the whole trial, don't they? They're even given They're commanded to take time off work in order to give it their full attention. Well, the apostles had to be those who had given their full attention to Jesus, pulled away from their jobs so that they listened to him from the baptism of John up until he was taken up. The apostles were qualified to witness because they were there. Puts them in a unique position to tell us about Jesus, doesn't it? Puts them in the very best position. So many today are prepared to set themselves up as experts about the Lord Jesus, even when they depart from this apostolic word. They're ready to talk about the real Jesus, even while those who were there have actually told us what the real Jesus was like. How foolish for us to listen to someone else when we've got access right here to listen to those who are best placed to tell us about it. The witnesses were qualified to witness because they were there. And then secondly, they were chosen. Let me carry on reading from verse 23. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So they found two who fit the bill, two people who'd been there throughout Jesus' ministry, and then they cast lots, and they basically tossed a coin. 
Now, this is not a recipe for how to get guidance from God, although I actually think they did something that just seems quite sensible to me. Uh, They thought wisely about their decision. They found two equally good options, and both of them being fine, they tossed a coin. That just seems sensible to me. But Luke isn't writing it to explain how to get guidance. He wants to show us that Matthias was Jesus' choice. A look again at their prayer in verse 24. You, Lord, a Lord in the New Testament, almost always talking about Jesus. You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. And maybe they remembered uh, the proverb that the lot is cast in the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. They knew that the Lord is in control of everything, even the tossing of a coin. And so they cast lots and knew that the outcome was Jesus' choice. Matthias is chosen by Jesus. Indeed, if you just turn back to the beginning of Acts and look at Acts chapter 1, verse 2, you'll see at the end of that verse that all of the apostles were those whom Jesus had chosen. They weren't just there in the right place at the right time. They were chosen, hand-picked, like a biography writer who doesn't just have the right information, but who is authorized to write it down. Here are the core team, the foundation of the church, and they are qualified for the role because they were handpicked by Jesus himself to be his witnesses. That's why I called this sermon Apostles Assemble. Those who are familiar with the Marvel film franchise will recognize that as a nod to the Avengers movies, in which a character called Nick Fury handpicks a group of superheroes, whom he calls the Avengers, who go out and save the world a specific group who are uniquely qualified and are handpicked for a world-saving mission. Do you see the connection? A specific group who are uniquely qualified and are handpicked for a world-saving mission. Except, of course, this is a far greater deal at the Marvel film franchise, maybe the biggest film franchise in history. But whatever else it is, it is only fiction. Whereas the apostles have literally changed the world. Their witness to the Lord Jesus has transformed societies. And most importantly, as we'll see throughout this term, as we look at the book of Acts, it is through their witness that Jesus' kingdom is advancing to the end of the earth, offering the chance to be saved to whoever hears it, whoever hears the message of Jesus. The apostles are the specific group, uniquely qualified and handpicked for this world-saving mission. And they're qualified to witness because they were there from the beginning. They saw Jesus in action and he handpicked them for, his role, uh, for that role. There's lots of questions that we just don't have time to cover right now. Maybe you're wondering why I put Isaiah 43 on the handout. I'm sorry, we don't have time to look at it now, but do ask me later. And maybe you're wondering about the Apostle Paul, who's not listed in Acts chapter 1. Don't worry, we'll get to him later on this term. Maybe you're wondering how our witness fits in. Well, for that, please do come back next week. And please do come back next week as we read about the coming of the Holy Spirit. I think next week's passage might be one of the most important passages in the whole of the New Testament. And you can tell me at the end of next week's sermon whether you think that's right. But as we start to draw to a close, can you see why we should have certainty about the apostles? If you're not a Christian, can you see why this New Testament, the testimony of the apostles, might be worth paying attention to? why the authorized writings of that apostolic band might still be interesting to us 2,000 years later. This is not a, a random book that stands alongside any other, but the authorized testimony of Jesus' hand-picked witnesses. It is worth paying close attention to. In fact, that's why we have small groups this year that, are going to be, that, will, be, that will be looking at the book of Mark. Uh, Mark, which records Peter's testimony. What a great chance to hear more from the authorized witnesses. Uh, Please come along to the welcome evening on Wednesday to hear more about why we're doing that. But can you also see 
why these words will shape us as a church. Now, there's loads of things that we could be about as a church, loads of things that we could do, loads of people we could listen to. But this apostolic band are the only ones qualified to tell us the words of Jesus and the only ones handpicked to do so. I said last week, if you're looking for a church, then please make sure that it's a church that is committed to what Jesus is doing in the world today. Spirit-backed witness to the ends of the earth. But we can develop that a little bit now, can't we? Please make sure that it is committed to the spirit-backed apostolic witness to the end of the earth. That is, make sure that it is committed to the apostolic word, the Bible. We'd love for you to settle here at St. Helens, but wherever it is you settle, make sure it is a church that doesn't just open the Bible, that doesn't just read from the Bible, but a church that gives you the teaching of the Bible, that gives you the testimony of the apostles. We are a church that cares about lots of things. We care about people. We care about the world. Most of all, we care about Jesus. And because we care about Jesus, we want to listen to his hand-picked witnesses. And so we're a church that cares lots about the Bible. And it's my hope that when I die, however I die, I might have the same going to the stake certainty that Roland Taylor had. Good people, I have taught you nothing but God's holy word and those lessons that I have taken out of God's blessed book, the Holy Bible. And I am come hither this day to seal it with my blood. Shall we pray as we close? Our Father, we praise you again for the Lord Jesus, for his wonderful salvation, and for his ongoing work. We praise you for, for his commissioning of these apostles, and for this glimpse of why we can trust them. Please, we pray, would you give each and every one of us in this room the kind of certainty that we should have, that we can have, in their authoritative word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.